see you in the movies that you're like this, uh, well you are, you're an amazing athlete. It, you don't just fall or knock things over, it's all very choreographed. And maybe we could talk a little bit about how you learned how to do that. Yeah, I watched It's not film. just, I mean, it's not just anybody could come in here and like fall, knock everything over here. I mean, that's not what you do. You, you, you do something very, very different. And I know that eventually it, it must have become a physical nightmare for you. Did you see the Patsy? Yes. <laughs> the falling vases. It took me six months to get the weight distribution in the vases correct, the size of the vase correct, the thickness of it correct, then the stanchion that it sat on had to be exact. And I called in a mathematician from UCLA to help me understand weights and measures. Because if you remember, I just bumped into the stanchion and the statue went this way. Had I not caught it by the base of the statue, it would have gone. But the way I caught it, it left that much between shattering and the floor. And I did that four times in take one is what I printed. I rehearsed it for three or four hours after having worked on it for six months and then shot take one. So it's all the work that goes before. The shooting's oh, easy. Sure. It's, all, it's all about preparation. Some of my best ad libs take six, seven hours. <laughs> yeah, it's, um, it takes a tremendous amount of talent. And, and think about the fact that the, what the audience loves is Jerry Lewis, he falls down, the, the, you know, all the, all the different things, the bellboy, the guy who can never do this right. I wonder if they know what brains it takes to no. be that character. Do they no. know that? Uh -uh. They they're not supposed know to know that. Say that again. They're not supposed to know that. They are not supposed to know that the mind that beats behind that idiocy is bright enough not to be an idiot. And you spoil everything that you're doing for them. They really accept that he is a nerd or that he has no balance, whatever and can bump into four vases and just catch them out of luck. You tell them he rehearsed for six months to understand the weights and measures and the beauty of how that visual joke worked, there'd be no humor in it. They would be examining it the way Einstein looked at charts. Right. But it also, for you, posed a problem because I was, I was reading the account of uh, Wilder wanting me to play the Some part like opposite Tony Curtis and mm -hmm. something like that. And you turned it down. And Joey was saying, oh, he turned that down. And I said, but Joey, Jerry Lewis at that point could only be Jerry Lewis. Nobody wanted to see Jerry Lewis unless he was Jerry Lewis. They didn't want to see Jerry Lewis play somebody's husband or uh, a character, mm -hmm. you know. And I, I think that in a way that's what stardom is about, right? I guess that, that is stardom. But it keeps you, you know, the pressure on you to keep. Yeah, but it was never the audience's call of what they wanted to see. It's the call of the individual performer who knows when to stretch. Right. Well, did you want to? I mean... No. I did everything. If you said to me, do you have any regrets? I would say just one. I'm sorry, I was never a Viking. No. So <laughs> row. <laughs> Tell no. me, so row. Well, you did, you did uh, have to go along with the program because you did play opposite Tony Curtis in Boeing, Boeing. That was your last, you had a con contractual commitment to right. Wallace, right? Mm -hmm. So 
there are, I mean, you've, you've made the, the compromises uh, that you've had to make to, to stay in this business. I mean, you, had to fulfill, you have to fulfill a contract, you right. have to do it. Um, going back to the 50s, when you were living in, in Hollywood and it was a small town and, and Tony was at Universal and people were trying to teach him how to speak so that they could understand what he was saying. <laughs> What was that? What was he like then, and what were you like? I mean, did you just think that you had come to this place and and life couldn't be better? You had, you know, you had fame, you had money. I mean, were you, what was that like for you with him? I mean, did you you knew him then? I think you lived right next door to him or something. No, close to him. <coughs> no, he lived right over the hill. He was over the hill, ten right? minutes away from me. Right. But we were both fish out of water. Yeah. I mean, why? Would a 20 year old, if he was in his right mind, with a two year old son, buy 14 cars? When I look back on it, it's pretty funny. Right. Pretty funny. Right. Some people I knew in Hollywood collected horses, had great stables, and did productive work with them. Other people had other devices, needs, and toys. I loved the cars. I didn't even know what the hell to drive every day. Yeah, in that book that you hate, uh, the writer says that people thought you were constantly having parties, 24-hour parties, because yeah. there were so many cars. And I hated parties like poison. I know, I know. But you did, at a time, you know, when no one was, you really lived like Swanson and uh, Valentino and all the great old stars. I mean, you lived mm -hmm. that life. Sure. That was that, that was very conscious, wasn't it? Oh, yeah. Of course. That's all part of putting on airs. But what you're really doing is you're telling yourself that you've made it. That's all that is. When in fact you haven't really made it yet. The jury was still out. You think the jury was still out? I, I, I think you were. I mean, how could the jury have still been out? Look well, at what you had done by then. Yeah, but by then we were still seven day wonders in the eyes of the public until we really we weren't entrenched until like 52 or 53. I'm talking about 48. I see. When I was just getting enough money to buy all those cars. You take an 18 year old kid and say, we're taking you from this $100 a week job you got and you're getting 2,500. That's a very, very big boost. Plus the fact I had the mental capacity of an IQ that I knew was there. They tell me that the IQ that you have at 25 stays with you the rest of your life. I had an IQ of 189, and I was smart. I but know. not about mm. emotions or passion. I was not smart about future thinking. Everything was today. What can I do today that's wonderful and exciting? But my creative process, my need to learn my business, to find out how many sprockets in a 35 millimeter frame, and then why? Why did we go out of frame with a three sprocket? Why could we not get back? My, curio my curiosity and needing to know this craft I was in was such an obsession with me that by the time I was in the picture business two years, there wasn't a job of any member of a 160-man crew that I couldn't do, including second assistant camera, which is one of the toughest. That's reloading. 
And when you're reloading 35 millimeter Panavision cameras or BNCs at the time, it's very critical work. And the crew loved to watch me load up. Well, you know, we, have to stop this. well we could say that that was because you didn't really have any trouble figuring out new and zany ideas. Oh, so I that, did. I did. So that maybe that was the easy part. So the you very beginning tap. was that I had to know why that worked mm -hmm. and how it worked mm -hmm. and what would we do if it didn't work. Mm -hmm. Now a crew, in the case of today, we've got two. Our sound man loves the fact that he knows more about his racket than I do. And he is not going to have a problem telling me what I would like to know. Because it gives him a moment of one-upsmanship. And there isn't a member on a 160-man crew that I ever had that didn't have the greatest time telling me everything I needed to know. They were my teachers. That's right. That's right. And most of them were on every production I did for 25 years. Like your, like your actors, too. They were like, the same. Mm -hmm. Kathleen Freeman. I had more goddamn retirement parties <laughs> losing my crews. Wonderful, wonderful, brilliant, talented men who, when I came to Paramount, they were 40-ish. By the time I was into films for 25 years, they were retiring. But I keep in touch with all of them. Can you, is there a story about the first time you ever did a scene with Kathleen Freeman, the custard scene? Is that the first scene? The custard scene in the circus movie? Yes. Like the first, yes. is there a story with that? I mean, did somebody else hire her for the film? Did you? How did you first No, she was hired. The circus film was a Hal Wallace film. That's how I met Kathleen. She was hired to play the lady at the custom stand. I had never seen body rhythm like Kathleen. Not hearing her dialogue and her, her facial expressions that was, was the acting, I was so taken by her body rhythm half turns, quarter turns, things that I know about in comedy, seeing someone else equally as appraised, apprised of what to do in those circumstances. So I fell in love with her. And then I hardly ever did a film without her after that. And was it also, though, that her look gave you just oh, so well, of many course. things? Right? She had that I mean, when you take her through the car wash mm -hmm. and the errand boy, she has that wonderful look that says second banana. That's right. That's right. She's a first banana's dream right. because she's a brilliant actress right. with an infinite, infinite sense of comedy. Yeah. And the greatest love of her life is being directed by a competent and she'll bust her ass for you when she's with an incompetent director who doesn't know what he wants, which, by the way, is what crews hate more than anything. Indeci <laughs> the one guy, the indecision. One guy to do and a guy do that it. doesn't do his homework. <laughs> That's right. Okay? He puts members of the crew, I mean, half of the young guys in the business today will wind up at the home at 55 years old because of incompetence. All a crew wants for you is this very, very simple premise. Tell me what you want and how you want to see this, and we'll get it for you. But because you're indecisive, we don't know where to put the goddamn camera. Right. And that's frustrating and hard work. When I come into my set, my day plot is in the book. I open it up for my crew to see. We have a production meeting. Half hour before we shoot, everyone knows where we're going, every setup, and what they have to do. You had people like Kathleen Freeman. You loved those mothers like Agnes Moorhead, oh, Judith yeah. 
Judith Anderson was mm. it like Dame Judith original? Anderson? Huh? Dame, Dame right? Judith Anderson. Uh, uh, the cold women and then the the clown women. Mm -hmm. But you didn't keep like glamour girls going coming back in the movies. Why why was that? Was it that they were? I, I don't. I don't know that I didn't do that. I don't remember that you did. I just I remember all these other women through the movies, but I I never remember who the leading women were from your movies. It's funny. I just don't remember. Well, that. the older women I didn't have to take to the dressing room. The younger <laughs> ones were getting me exhausted. I think that's might have been what it was. <laughs> <laughs> you know what Joey said to me? He said. Uh, we're talking about something about being on the road and, and l the loneliness of being on the road. And I said, you know, after Dean, it must have been so lonely for Jerry to be on the road because most people are on the road alone. But to have a partner to be on the road, somebody to eat with, that had to be harder even than performing. So he, said, he was telling me that his brother got off the train. They were on, you were on some long thing. And his wife met him, uh, and she said, uh, um, Gee, I heard you. Have, I heard you have all these girls with you, and he said, "No, there were days we had no girls at all." <laughs> it was like a very. So, I'm digressing. Now. That's okay. All right. Um, so let's. Um, I got myself lost here. Um, let's go back just one little bit because I'm going to cover most of this on the stage. John, for more, John, you have a phone call at the stage door, John. Um. I wanted to ask you a uh, little bit about your dad. I, I don't know how you want to handle this, but in a biography, you've got to deal not just with the parents, because they have such a, a big play, and of course we're going to have a lot on your parents, lots of pictures, and present the whole, uh, their whole experience of struggling through those, the vaudeville and, you know, Burlesque and vaudeville. That's right, and I think Lenny Bruce used to sum it up best when he talked about how they all ended up like in the early days of television on Strike It Rich. Let's make a deal. Mm -hmm. um, there's been so much written about your relationship with your father and your relationship with your mother, and then your marriage at such a young age. You're striking out, like what, at 16 with Irving K. Mm -hmm. How? How do you think we should make people understand about that? I mean, do you think that, that your dad, if, if I'm right, didn't want you to go into show business because it just had been such a disappointment for him? He was almost like the wrong guy. Uh, he was in the wrong place at the wrong time in terms of the history, you know? Um, I don't know how we do that because a very dear friend of mine who is a great musician and loves your work, said to me, Jerry Lewis was like Charlie Parker. When he came on the scene, everybody else looked old hat. And very few people do that. I mean, it's just, it happens. And it makes what went before look stale. I was bringing the clone of my father to the business. There isn't anything that you've ever seen me do in all of your research that I didn't learn from him. Why do you think he wasn't successful? He didn't want to be. I don't think so. He struggled so hard to earn money. He struggled very, very hard. But his claim to fame was, when I would say to him, Dad, with the kind of talent you had, you could have been the biggest star in the world. Why didn't you push more? Mm -hmm. He said, because I fed you, I fed your mother, I clothed her and clothed you. I didn't need any more than that. But I think he did. How could he have you and not, I mean, work all his life and then see you and, and not, not have that feeling of jealousy? He knew about it, that's why. Uh -huh. When I made it and made it big, he would sit in the corner of the room and we're all partying after a big opening night at the Copa. He's sitting in the corner of the room and I'd walk over to him and I'd say, are you okay? He said, I'm better than you. I said, why? He said, you have to mingle with all of that. It's all inane. It means nothing. You did all you needed to do tonight for me to be proud of you. People paid to see you 
bust your ass on the stage and you came off sweating. You did your job. All of this is just annoying decorations that you're gonna have to live with the rest of your life. And the bigger the star you get, the bigger the parties will get. But that wasn't really true, because you had a great time. I had a wonderful time. I mean, that but sounds... he was right about... But he's like a different person. That sounds like a different person from you talking. You know what I'm saying? Let me tell you. In the Palace Theater in April, they had the Easter Bonnet Show. Mm -hmm. <coughs> Do you want some water or something? No, I'm fine, thank you. I was to walk out after a certain... Oh, Sunset Boulevard did their thing. Uh -huh. All the shows on Broadway were doing this for AIDS. Right. I walked out, and you'd think it was the coming of Christ or the parting in the Red Sea. That audience went insane my just walking out on the stage. They stood and they paid homage to the old Jew like you never saw in your life. And I thanked them and I told them I was happy to be a part of this wonderful benefit for AIDS, which was really Broadway Cares for AIDS. And I said, I want you guys to know something. There's 3,000 theatrical people from Broadway there, 3,000 of them. I said, I want all you guys to know something. Before I opened the damn Yankees, I was asked the question, how are you going to handle the grueling eight shows a week? And my answer to that is today, to all of you, the eight grueling shows a week, one, are not grueling. I'm having the best time of my life. Eight shows a week is just a piece of cake. But I'll tell you this, the parties and the birthday cakes are going to put me in my grave. And they scream. See, at every intermission, we have what the theater community calls, uh, uh, what do they call it? A, uh, a moment of, oh, at this intermission, we're going to have a moment of celebration. That means someone in the cast or in the music has a birthday. We only have 15 minutes of the intermission, yet everyone goes up to the green room and a cake is prepared and, and the, in, the recipient of the, the cake blows it out and everybody sits around and eats a piece of cake and they do that. It would kill me. And then after the show, it's this party, it's that party. It's this producer who has absolutely no talent, who just wants to rub elbows with the company of a Broadway show. Well, pal, it's a lot of work. my father was right. It's a lot of work. I don't do it. I will not go to cocktail parties and listen to some inane woman say, I saw you at the New York Paramount, and I had the best time, and seeing you here tonight, I'm going to tell my dad about it. I would love you to sign my cocktail napkin, and I'm about close to puking. But when you were much younger, you believed that you had to go back out there. It didn't matter how many great movies you made. You had to go back out and tour and give them tour. back. And even when I was younger. You even when I was younger. Right. Never partied. I had my own parties with right. my own friends our right. own way. Right. But I have one philosophy that will never, ever change, and it is the following. A woman says to me at the stage door, I've been waiting for an hour. I said, I made no appointment with you, so don't lay any guilt on me that you waited for an hour. That's your individual mentality to wait for an hour. She says, well, I want you to sign this and now, because I waited an hour. I said, now let me tell you why I'm not going to sign it. She had the playbill in her hand. I said, you went into that theater, you bought a ticket, and I did everything I was supposed to do based on what that ticket represents. 
My responsibility to you is to work my ass off, do the best show I can. When the curtain comes down, yours and my connection is cut. You are now imposing on my life because these minutes that I'm taking to explain to you are taking away from my wife and my child. That's right. You don't own me for a $70 ticket. But there was a time when they did, you, you weren't that strong. Well, you get enough of it and then you get strong. I got tired of signing toilet paper. I got tired of signing something that meant so much to this man and then you would see him put it in his pocket with a bunch of crumped up dollar bills. It wasn't important. But to touch the hem of the garment of a great man in the eyes of these weird ducks is what that's all about. It's not just the fans, it's, it's, it's everybody. The, um, the, uh, I think that, that uh, one of the things that struck me so much about the description of the guys who went on that Nutty Professor promo tour with mm -hmm. you was not just that they were kind of Damon Runyon characters, Jack Keller, those people, but Unlike a lot of the people that surround younger stars today, they really cared about you. I oh. mean, they wanted to, they, whatever it took to keep you, as they said, in the mood, mm -hmm. they realized that when the chips were down, only one person had to go out there. They knew that. So, and, and, <laughs> and we also had a very important ingredient. They knew how much I loved them, and they loved me back. That's right. That's right. So they were not an entourage. It was a family that went out together on these tours, and they helped me get through it. Wow. That was an amazing family, I think. Keller used to say to an annoyance, you can't have his time. That's all he's really got in this life, his time. Right. And when it runs out and he's gone, you'll find somebody else to annoy. Right, right. And he used to handle a lot of other things, like mm -hmm. Luella and all those people. All of them. How would he do that? Well, he was a he was a masterful press agent. He was the best that ever lived. Can you give me an example? Something you recall? Well, Loretta Luella Parsons would call me, and if you don't call Luella Parsons back in Hollywood, you're out of the business. I called Jack and said Luella Parsons called me. And I didn't call her back. He said, I'll fix it. He calls up and he says to Luella, he's got so much on his mind and he's really so busy, he probably forgot, but what can I do for you? And he would have his way of dealing with that. But they also had, he also had great honesty with you. Oh, he was a, he was a very, he shot from the hip. He taught me how to be forthright. I mean, uh, you don't make a lot of friends this way. Right. See, Because they don't want you to be forthright. It struck me so much that rather than being like the yes, yeah, I'm not saying all of them, but people like Jack Keller, rather than being the yes them that you created in the Patsy, they were the guys who would really tell you uh, the truth. In other words, if the show wasn't good, then well, what will I tell you, Jerry? You know, it, it's scary when you see uh, what goes on today with people. Because I've been in instances where, yeah, where it's all.